My name is Case Cook, uh, here presenting um, with Gustavo. Uh, my name is Gustavo. Um, we're talking about the progress on bounds checking in C and most uh, specifically how it applies to Linux kernel. Um, if you want to follow along, the slides are there since we have some links uh, in each page. Um, just quick agenda, what we're talking about. Like our goal is memory safety. We're going to talk, look at you know the 50 years of history of C and its missing bounds checking, um, problems with the existing workarounds, where the current mitigations are, and why they lack coverage, um, and then what we've done to improve coverage, both with refactoring and annotation, um, <coughs> and then the compiler work we've got, and some numbers at the end. So, um, goal is memory safety. Um, one of the more uh, tractable topics for memory safety is just bounds checking, getting spatial safety. Um, a huge number of security flaws fall into this basic category, and a lot of it could be solved by the compiler. Um, the, the problem is that the standard C language is just too ambiguous and lacks a way to describe a lot of these bounds. Um, for simple arrays that are fixed size at compile time, uh, these protections exist. There's all kinds of uh, features we'll talk about later um, where you can say, hey, if you've got an array of 16 bytes, cool, the compiler knows everything about it. It can do bounds checking at runtime. It can do bounds checking at compile time, all sorts of fun things. Um, but if it's not fixed, if it's not a fixed size at compile time, you're in the C language, you're basically just left with a pointer which has no information about how large the region is you're pointing to, and that's just the basic type that's available. You have no choice. Um, the reason this is important is because a really common data storage pattern is to have a header with a whole bunch of repeated elements afterwards. Um, and in, in standard C, prior to C99, you had no way to associate the, the, the items that are following with the header. Um, so you'd have to you know, add up the allocation, and then you'd refer to the items that follow the header with a kind of a horrible cast to an addition off a pointer that's the wrong type. So you're lying to the compiler because there isn't really a second header, and like you're just doing terrible, terrible things to work around the lack of this. Um, you could have a pointer to the items, and this pointer would point to immediately after itself. So this is a kind of pointless exercise, but at least you now have an association inside that initial header structure that, yeah, you are, in fact, going to be followed by a whole list of items. So you're still doing the terrible casting. You're still doing this weird iteration, but at least um, there's an association. What's really wanted is a way to say, hey, I've got an array of these elements. And now the allocation is straightforward. You can iterate them, but what goes in the square braces? Um, and this was the problem uh, long ago. C didn't have any solution to this. So people lied about it. They said, I've got an element count. I've got an array that there's one element in it. Because of course, zero is not a valid uh, size of an array in standard C. They'd say, I've got one element. And off they went and continued to use many elements off the end, way beyond the single element. Um, this had all kinds of problems that we're going to talk about uh, in a second here. And in, in 1990, the GNU extension said, OK, we'll allow zero length, because at least we can use this as a, as a notable extension. Standard C doesn't allow it, so it's a distinct feature uh, that will give us the ability to solve some of the problems with the fake one element array, fl uh, flexible array. Um, but this also had all kinds of problems because you're still lying to the compiler. You said, I, I have a size zero array. And you go, well, is it really? No, it's not. So 1990, we get C99 with an official flexible array member, which is just empty. Um, so at least you're not lying to the compiler directly anymore, but you still have no idea how big this is. Um, and then even worse than that is since we've had 50 years of horrible hacks um, working around this, there are cases where People had a fixed size array at the end of some structure, and they said, you know what? This actually wasn't big enough. We're going to make it dynamically sized, but we're not actually going to refactor any code whatsoever. We're just going to pretend that that number that isn't 1 or 0 is just totally a lie. So we're going to ignore it completely. Um, we can talk about problems with existing workarounds. Yeah, so um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the issues we have with the uh, with one element arrays and zero-length arrays in particular. So 
the, the one problem with one element arrays is, well, that one element. So um, whenever people uh, need to make use of the size of the container structure, they need to be acutely aware at all times that they are also carrying with it the size of, of that one element of this uh, array. So that's really problematic and because, well, it is going to force to the developers to always pay attention uh, to any place where they need to compute either the size of the container structure or, or the size of, uh, of the one element and see if they need to, to subtract from that size uh, either one in the case of, uh, of a variable that holds the, the total elements of, uh, of our array as in the case of the, of the line of code uh, at the bottom or, well, any other case that the, in which uh, this size, the size of this one element uh, can be considered as spurious, which is, uh, well, basically at all times, except when we need to allocate uh, a space in memory for, for our containing structure and for our array. So here, well, we have an example of, uh, of the declaration of a one element array inside a stroke engine. In this case, I decided to call this stroke engine merely to illustrate that, well, this is the all, all way of doing this. So uh, we don't want to do this anymore. So uh, yeah, you, you, you shouldn't do this anymore too. And another problem with one element arrays is that, well, you might know that we've been trying to enable array bounds for uh, more than a couple of years now. And well, if we enable array bounds, uh, we are going to see a lot of false positives because, well, array bounds, what it checks is that we are not accessing our array outside, our, outside the boundaries of the array. And if we declare a one element array, well, the only valid index that we can access our array through is going to be zero. So uh, that is not the case uh, when we are using this type of array because the idea is that at runtime, the, the size of this array is going to be uh, larger, right? So, yeah, chances are we are going to try to access this, this array uh, through, index, uh, through an index uh, greater than zero. So, so yeah, we've been fixing a lot of false positives, um, trying to enable array bounds. And well, this is an example of, uh, of the type of warning that you're going to see if you're running to this issue. Uh, what's great about this is that, well, array bounds is also uh, detecting, has been detecting uh, some actual bugs and well, we've been fixing those, and well, we're about to, uh, to finally enable this option. The problem with this is that in recent times, uh, some of the false positives uh, that, have been, that have been reported by the compiler are actual uh, problems with the, with the compiler code. So that's been delaying this, uh, this, the progress in, in this work. Okay, so what are the problems with zero length arrays? Well, they are slightly less problematic but still, uh, something that, well, first, they are not part of the C standard, right? So another thing that, that we need to be aware of is that we have detected uh, some, some code where developers were applying the size of operator to this type of array. The issue with that is that, well, we are always going to get zero as a result. And what we have seen is that they were trying to, to use the result of this operation, which is always zero, in other operations like multiplications. Maybe they were, uh, they were trying to get the total size of the array at runtime, uh, and well, that's an issue, so we had to fix that. Um, and well, I have an example here of how uh, people usually uh, um, compute the size for the allocation of the container structure in the zero length array at runtime. This is a common idiom. Okay, another problem with this, with this type of arrays is that sometimes um, people can introduce problems like undefined behavior inadvertently. So in this case, I have here an example of a, of a patch that added a new member to this structure after the declaration of a zero length array. So the problem with this code is that at runtime, this, this array is going to be used as a flexible array. So this is as an object of variable length, right? So the size at runtime is going to be much greater than zero, of course. I, I found this code and well, of course, 
Here, uh, the easy fix is, well, we just move uh, the zero length array declaration again at the end of the structure, and that would be the fix. But if we also transform this array into a flexible array member, now the compiler is going to enforce this behavior. So the next time that someone comes and try to uh, add a new member and make the same mistake, adding a, mem adding a member uh, just after this array, well, now the compiler is going to complain. And, and that's, al uh, that's always great because uh, we are becoming the compiler our ally. And in these cases, well, this is something I guess uh, we should always strive for. So, of course, this, uh, this was the solution, right? So just move the, the array at the, at the end of the structure and transform it into a flexible array member. So this, is, this was the kickoff uh, for uh, the flexible array transformations in the kernel self-protection project. This was uh, the moment when we realized uh, how important it was to transform these arrays. And uh, just to mention that this bug was introduced in 2011 and uh, we fixed it in 2019. Here I have another example. This is, uh, this is interesting because what happens here is that the developer uh, originally uh, they had in their code uh, an array of 18 items, right? And then they wanted to transform this into, into a, an object of variable length at runtime. So they decided to transform this array into a one element array. So they even added a comment, right, with the intention. The thing is that uh, they also had this structure where they declare a couple of members of the type of the structure containing the one element array. So the problem here is that if we, well, if they try to use this array as a variable length object at runtime, they are going to run into the same issue as, as the previous example. Um, so they needed to move uh, these declarations, at least this one, uh, at the end of the structure. The others are fine because they are pointers. Oh, well, another thing, <laughs> another uh, funny thing to notice here is that, well, the developer transformed a pointer to a type of this structure into a pointer to void. So that's, that's, that's obscure, so we, we really don't want to do that, but when, anyways. Okay, so as I mentioned, um, they, they forgot to move this, uh, the declaration of this, of this member at the end of this structure. And well, um, I was doing some work and I ran into, into, um, into this one element array. And when I transformed this into a flexible array member, it was when I noticed this problem. So what I did was, well, I transformed the, the flexible array, the, the one element array into a proper C99 flexible array member. And then, well, I moved the declaration of this member from the middle of the structure uh, at the bottom, at the end of the structure. And with that, that, that issue is fixed. And well, just to mention, this bug was introduced in, two, in 2017 and was fixed in 2020. And well, this is uh, another interesting case. Um, size of is going to return, of course, different results uh, when we apply this operator to all these different uh, variants of, uh, uh, of declaring a variable length object. So, of course, if we apply size of to a one element array, we are going to get the size of that one element. If we apply size of to a zero length array, of course, we are going to get zero as a, as a result. In the, clay, in the case of a flexible array member, uh, a flexible array member is a, is a member it's a variable of incomplete type. So in that case, size of is going to return error. So we need to, uh, we need to be aware of, of this too. And this is, uh, this is a, another interesting case. Um, this is an example of code. Um, here I'm showing code uh, from BSD, where we have a structure, uh, we have a, an array of concrete size in this, in this socket address uh, structure that is going to behave, that a runtime is going to behave as a variable length object. So a runtime, our array is going to be from 14 bytes all the way up to 255. So this is, uh, a couple of months ago, this was the reason why compilers couldn't uh, reason properly about the sizes of, uh, of trailing arrays. 
So this is something we are uh, going to talk a little bit about uh, later on the, in the presentation, but this is an interesting case too. Okay. Yes. <clears throat> so while there are mitigations that we can use in the compiler, um, we've got array bounds, which will tell us all kinds of things at compile time and fix them permanently. Um, we've got the sanitizers that'll do runtime bounds checking and says, hey, I've got a fixed size array. I don't know yet how much I'm going to be using or where I'm going to be indexing or how far I'm going to be copying. And at runtime, we can check the index or the offsets. Um, and then similarly, the, the built-ins, built-in object size, built-in dynamic object size provide similar uh, checking for uh, sort of fortified stuff like mem copy, string copy. Uh, but none of these work for trailing arrays. Um, whether the size is specified or not. Um, and so the problem here is if you've got an array in the middle, no problem, we're protected, mitigations work, that's great. Um, if you have something at the end, the compiler just completely steps away and says, I can't know, code from 50 years ago has been doing insane things for so long, I cannot reason about this whatsoever. And then there's one where there's the size is specifically unknown. Um, and it's also trailing, so it's not protected. Uh, but we want to have protection of something that actually the size is known. Um, so in GCC 13 and Clang 16, um, strict flex arrays option was added, which basically says, turn off all the insanity. Don't have any of the weird workarounds and other stuff. If you specify a size, it is using that size. Just done. Um, and if you need a, a a dynamically sized member uh, at the end, it's got to be a C99 flexible array. So now we're back to, it's not about whether it's trailing, it's about whether the size is known. So if it's in the middle, it's at the end, if you have a specified size, you're done, mitigations actually work and apply. So now we've still got this problem of what do we do with unknown sized objects, coming back around to the, the weakness in the C language itself. So the compiler feature that's being worked on, it's currently called element count. It is likely it'll get renamed to counted by or something, but the, the idea here is in most structures that have these kinds of trailing arrays, there is some other member within the structure that is used by the logic of the program to determine how big it is. Um, you know, you're gonna have a for loop that walks through every array element. You're gonna have some counter that says what the maximum element is. So we needed a way to specify, to hint to the compiler, hey look, here is the actual size, you know, here's how many elements I have. Um, and this actually gets us the point of being able to add the sanitizer protection, add uh, this logic to the built-ins where we can actually check at runtime the size of this array. Okay, now let's see how we are, well, how we are transforming these arrays. Okay, I'm going to talk about the general case of uh, one element arrays and zero length arrays. So, this example is, uh, to me, is the most uh, benevolent example I can show you. Uh, in this case, well, we have a stroke foo that contains a one element array of type, uh, the element type of this array is going to be a stroke bar, right? And well, we have here, we are uh, allocating memory through uh, KM alloc um, to, uh, for the whole structure and uh, a number of elements for, the, for our array. If you notice here, again, I am, uh, we are subtracting one from count, which is the variable that is going to hold the total number of elements in our array. And the reason for that, again, is because uh, the size of the one element is already included uh, when, we, when we apply size up to a star p, right? So we have to, uh, we have to compensate for, for, for that size. And well, we are going to do something. So we are going to copy some data into our array through main copy, and then we're going to iterate uh, uh, over our array, and, and that's it, right? Okay, so how we, how we transform this? Uh, well, the simple solution is just we remove the one from the declaration of the one element array and we remove the subtraction from count. And that's it, that, that, that is the solution. The sad thing about this is that uh, maybe this is 1% of the cases that we have in the kernel. Um, the real story is more complicated. 
we need to audit instances of size, so when it is applied to, uh, when it's trying to, to get the size of the whole structure through, in this case, SRP. Uh, we need to audit uh, any instance of code uh, where we find size of applied to the array. Uh, when, need it, when, we find, when we find size of applied to the, to the type of the structure uh, that contains the array. And of course, when we find instances of size of applied to the type of the element of the array. We also need to identify which is the variable that is going to, to hold the total uh, number of items for our array and try to look for instances where, well, we are subtracting one from, from this variable. Okay, but what if we don't find, in this case, count minus one and we only find count? Is that intentional? Was that a bug? So we need to, we need to read a lot of code and try to determine what was the, the original intention. So, yeah, in some cases, we, we have found that uh, the, the code, the original code, already contains bugs, and we have to, to fix it. Also, what is quite interesting as well is uh, when, we, when the type of our array is subsized one byte, as it could be if we declare our one element array of type uh, uin8 or, or char. In this case, people uh, just subtract one from, from, from any of these uh, uh, size of operators. Yeah, we need to look for instances in the whole code, well, in the code that concerns uh, our array, of course, uh, instances of, uh, of minus one. So to, tar to try to determine if, uh, if that code is correct and if we need to remove that minus one, if that minus one is correct. So yeah, it's a lot of fun. Lastly, we need to find instances of code where our, the, the structure that contains our one element array is a member of another structure. And we need to see uh, if people is computing the size of that other structure and how they are computing that size. And if we are missing, uh, oh well, if they, are, if they are taking into account that they need to, uh, to remove or to subtract the size of our one element array, that is contained in this other structure and so on and so on. So yeah, it's, uh, it becomes messy in reality. So this is the reality of these transformations. We need to look for all these cases and try to make sure that we are uh, actually doing what needs to be done. In the case of uh, transforming zero length arrays into flexible array members, that's more straightforward. In this case, well, we can simply remove uh, the, the zero from the declaration and and that's, that's basically it. However, we sometimes uh, break user space, and this is something that we are going to see. And by the way, by the, way this is the script, the Coxinla script, uh, we use to, uh, to transform the vast majority of zero length arrays into proper C99 flexible array members. So you see that uh, fairly, it is a fairly simple script. We just identify the structure containing this array and remove the, the zero from, from the declaration. And that's it. And well, we also have the cases where we find these arrays in unions. So when we want to transform uh, either a one element array or a, one, or a zero link array into a flexible array member, and that array happens to be in a union, the compiler is going to complain. Um, there is no clear reason right now why that, that, that is the way it is. Because, well, we could have a, a, a zero length array in, in a union, and, and that's totally fine. Apparently, it's uh, just a definitional uh, problem, right? That probably is going to be uh, uh, fixed um, in, the f in the future. So, well, in this case, I have an example of uh, one of these um, instances of code where we have a union, we have a, a zero length array, and what we need to do in this case is just use uh, a helper that we have for, for these cases. So. Whenever we need to transform one of these arrays into a, a flexible array member, we can use the declare flex array member. So this, uh, the, the, the declare flex array helper. This helper is useful for uh, declaring uh, flexible arrays in unions and also alone in structures, which is, uh, is, is, uh, is a case we, we have found. Okay, now this is an example of how we've been doing all well, how we started to do these transformations in UAPI. At the beginning, well, 
what we what, what we were doing were was we were duplicating the whole structure into a union. So this is because we cannot simply uh, transform the one element array if it is in, in UAPI because user space is going to uh, is going to continue using that, that that member that array. So we cannot just remove and, and modify uh, UAPI in that way. What we need to do is we need to add a new member that is going to be a flexible array member and that, that member is going to be used by kernel space and the one element array is going to, to continue to be, using, be used by, by user space. So this is an example of how we were doing things um, at the time. Now, with the help of, of the declare flex array helper, we don't need to duplicate the whole, we, need, we, not, we don't need to duplicate the whole structure. We just need to uh, we just need to include the one element array in a union together with the declaration of our flexible array member that is going to be used by, by kernel space. So so the code uh, looks much better now. And well, this is a case where where uh, someone from Android reported me that well. I, uh, I had broken uh, UAPI, uh, user space through a change in UAPI. So what happened here is that the, the, the compiler is reporting that we have a flexible array member not at the end of a structure. As I have explained previously, uh, when we were uh, touching the case of, uh, of, of undefined behavior due to the addition of, of one of, of a new member to this structure containing a, a zero length array. The zero length array uh, was in the middle of the structure, so if we modify that array uh, and change it into a flexible array member, now the compiler was going to emit this same warning. So this is what, what, what was happening in, in user space. The code that introduced that bug uh, in UAPI, well, is this. Um, I send at some point I send a three white patch to UAPI to replace all those uh, all those zero link arrays, and well, it happens that this code uh, was being used in user space, and in particular in this structure. So this this code is uh, is user space code. So here we have a couple of members declared in the middle of a structure, and the type of these members is uh, the type of this. Uh, uh, of this uh, structure in UAPI. So yeah, now we have uh, a couple of members uh, that of a type of a structure that contains a flexible array member just in the middle of a structure. So that's wrong. <laughs> we need to modify this. The problem with this is that there are a couple of members, not only one. If it were only one, well, we could just move that member to the end of the structure and that would be the fix. But in this case, uh, I was honestly freaking out. I was like, uh, oh my god, I just broke user space, so Linux is going to kick me off uh, out of the, of the kernel community. And, uh, but, but, but yeah, the, the, the easy solution here is just to transform this into pointers. And that, that is what I proposed at, at the time, and that was actually uh, the, the solution. So, so yeah, so I, I survived that. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> so, uh, you know, as, as we go through and get all these into actual flexible arrays, then we're in the position of actually being able to add more information about their, their runtime size. Um, so annotating things where we can about uh, the size of allocations is possible, the alloc size uh, hint to the compiler. Uh, generally speaking, this is easy because you can just add the attribute to the end, specify which argument contains the size and bytes, and off you go. Um, the tricky bit in the kernel, of course, is that we have lots and lots and lots of specialized allocators that do different things, that are wrappers around other things, or uh, runtime fixed size allocations like the kmem cache alloc. So there's some problems in here, so it is somewhat limited in its use, um, and attributes get lost across inlines, which is a whole other bug in GCC. Um, but it does catch real things. Um, so you know, if you perform an allocation, Let's say here you've got your count on your alloc, and then you have a bug in whatever you're doing to access that array later. 
um, before, this wouldn't get caught, and, uh, and now with Alex size, you can actually see, oh, the size information is actually available here on that indexing, so the sanitizer can catch this. Um, of course, if you return from this function, that size information goes away, uh, but that's what we're hoping to fix later on here. Um, and so internally, also in, in addition to the um, indexing size information, you can use the built-in dynamic object size to find out the actual size of this thing. Uh, due to the Alex size hinting in that function. Um, so the next one, uh, which will get us much, much uh, wider coverage for uh, runtime size, is adding the, the counted by attribute. So normally, this is, again, pretty easy. F uh, structures have something that tracks it. Look, template and number templates. It's actually right there. Um, it may require humans to look at it. Um, so you just add, hey, this is counted by num templates, and off you go. And everywhere that you're using this structure in the kernel, now you actually have the runtime size available. So the built-ins will work and the sanitizers will work. Um, and you can actually find a bunch of these automatically. Uh, this is another Coxnell script for adding counted by. The pattern is you want to find the allocation where it's using the multiplier of the, the actual count followed by an assignment to uh, a member of uh, within that allocation. Um, and then you can basically take that information, find where that structure was defined, and add it in automatically. Um, I've got a, a series that finds about 160 of these uh, in the kernel with no special care whatsoever. It just finds this pattern. It's a really common pattern. Um, there is uh, some more compiler work uh, that we, that's sort of outstanding, um, ongoing work in GCC and Clang. Um, we still got this problem with dash w array bounds in GCC. GCC has uh, a really interesting and effective way of tracking uh, variable, like the, the range of values that may be assigned to a variable at compile time as it's going through as part of its analysis phase. Um, so we can actually specify, hey, looking at all the paths to this one place where you index this array, I can see that you're going to be out of bounds uh, in, under some condition. Uh, and I'll throw warnings about that, which is really helpful. It's a, it's a very powerful tool. Unfortunately, it has bugs. And we've been fighting these bugs for quite some time now. Um, we, with each release of the kernel, um, Gustavo and I have had all sorts of fixes landing. We're like, OK, we are warning clean. We are good to go, and then Linus uh, says, oh, uh, the development window is about to open. I will update to the latest Fedora with the latest GCC that has new false positives, and then I'll apply all these things and reject the fact that we can turn this on because now there's new false positives. Um, he's done this two releases in a row, at least the second time he apologized to us. <laughs> um, so I, I, am, I am foolishly hopeful that the last bug uh, in GCC for, for this is a problem of jump threading optimization. And once we get that fixed, hopefully, again, we can turn on dash W array bounds. Um, we also have a, there's a problem with nested flexible array structures. Um, Gustavo talked about this, you know, like if you're trying to count the, the, the one element array that's in a structure and some other structure includes that structure, you end up with this nested series of structures that ultimately end in a flexible array. Um, and uh, GCC and Clang both, if you ask the, the built-ins, how big is the structure, like the internal structure, it says, I don't know, it ends in a dynamically sized thing, I can't know its size. But if you ask it, how big is the structure that contains this structure, it says, oh, it's exactly the size of those two structures without any, the, we'll pretend the flexible array doesn't exist, which gets confusing if you are trying to target something in a couple in a sub-member of a structure. Um, so changing the visibility of that is ongoing in GCC. Uh, we're going to get that in Clang, too. Um, but there's some, since it's modifying the GNU extension of how that stuff gets processed, we're sort of waiting for it to be finalized in GCC before Clang follows that behavior specifically. Um, there's also some questions about how the sanitizer works um, for bounds checking of arrays versus arbitrary object size checking, which is a kind of wider span of things to examine. Um, but the latter, uh, the object size sanitizer has had a lot of code gen issues, like making images really big, um, and didn't seem to provide any coverage that dash w array bounds didn't already com uh, 
provide at runtime, at, at like array bounds would do it at compile time, but then the object size sanitizer would do the same checks at runtime, which was unnecessary and redundant. So we removed it, but there's some question about whether or not we're gonna need to bring that back and fix it to make it work better with uh, the coming annotations. Um, and then of course, coordinating the, the counted by or element count or whatever it's gonna be called uh, in the compilers. That one's ongoing. It's, there, there's active coordination between uh, Clang and GCC on that. Um, so I'm, I'm hopeful that that'll get resolved uh, and published soon. Um, let's see, and I promise numbers. So this is kind of hand wavy, but this was the, the last four years of refactoring uh, to use flexible array members. Uh, this isn't gonna be a super precise graph, but it does capture the sort of the, the general sense of the work that uh, needed to get done. And this starts back in like the 5.2 release uh, where Gustavo was talking about that initial realization that man, we're having bugs with the zero size stuff. We gotta fix this. And then the, the work started to start the refactoring after going, you know, there's, there's actually a lot of different things that depend on guess, getting flex, proper C99 flexible arrays used universally in the kernel with all the fake stuff gone. And there's sort of a bit of a, a flattened COVID area and then sort of tree-wide changes and then it's continuing. And we're basically close enough now that um, we've, we're gonna be turning on the, the strict flex arrays things, which will change code gen and make a lot of other, make any remaining bugs pop out. Um, we've had some, uh, some long-standing stuff that uh, we needed to fix first. Um, like the, we normally think of the kernel as being, you know, the, the ultimate upstream. Everyone else is downstream from the kernel distros and everything else, but actually the kernel is downstream for a couple of different projects like ACPI CA, which has its own thing and we just copy it directly into the kernel. Uh, but of course it being an older code base like the kernel had many zero and one length arrays scattered all throughout it. Um, so f getting that all cleaned up first, um, was required before we can turn on the strict flex arrays uh, because the kernel wouldn't boot. Because <laughs> it's like, oh, it's a zero sized array. Hmm. And I guess there's nothing else in this ACPI table. Doo -doo -doo. Um, so the other metric that's uh, not, not perfect, but it, it's interesting to look at is uh, looking at memcopy bounds checking. So that using those built-ins as opposed to indexing of arrays. Um, and look at that, so uh, for an x86-64 def config uh, um, with Fortify source enabled, um, in 6.1, we had about 46% coverage. Uh, would, you know, you'd actually perform good bounds checking. And that was without alloc size, without strict flex arrays. Um, in 6.3, alloc size is enabled, so we got about 54% coverage, and um, I did a build with uh, 6.4 RC1, and I forced uh, strict flex arrays on, uh, and we get about 56% coverage. Um, so uh, my joke on this one is over the course of five months, we've gained 10% coverage. So in March of 2025, we'll have 100% coverage, um, which is not true. Well, I'm sure we'll hit 90% coverage very quickly and then spend years trying to get the last 10%. Um, but I'm really hopeful that uh, when we add support for the counted by attribute, we're gonna be able to convert a lot of these, uh, you know, these unknown, right, which are the ones we can't mitigate. We convert unknown to dynamic, and we have the actual bounds for all the mem copies, all the indexing and everything that we're doing. Um, and I think that's it. Any, any questions, thoughts, concerns? Uh, yeah, maybe I missed it, but uh, I think I remember hearing that, you know, there are problems when you had a fixed array size, which was a lie, uh, and the classic one, of course, is BSD sock adder in BSD sock adder games, um, which, of course, you know, must have been really, really good uh, dose of LDS um, <laughs> at Berkeley. Um, how, does the, how does that get accommodated vis-a-vis -vis UAPI and uh, strict flex arrays equals three? Yeah, um, uh, thank you for your Star Trek reference. And um, uh, so what's interesting about that, the, the sock adder situation is that it was always a problem. Like making that lie created 
all kinds of chaos everywhere for every project that was using Sockadder. Um, and the kernel solution was actually to make another thing called like Sockadder storage, which is actually fully sized to the 255 max. And in most cases, all the internals are already using that in most places um, and, and don't care and everything's fine and you have this weird interface to UAPI where everyone kind of winks and says, yeah, it's 14 bytes, sure, sure, and everything works because they've been fighting this for since Sockadder decided to make that change. Um, inside the kernel, though, there's a lot of passing of just a Sockadder pointer and saying, eh, it's a Sockadder pointer, la, 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 I don't, and, and people have to cast it to whatever protocol and figure out whatever it is. So that one has been painful to sort of deal with, and, and uh, a lot of those have been found by sort of turning on the, the, the sanitizer in warning only mode, where we don't reject anything, but we go, ha, ha, what are you doing? Well, this is bad. Um, and uh, there was a large uh, patch set uh, that we landed for NFS. A bunch of the NFS internals needed to be fixed to, to not trip the compiler's checking. Like, it was fine. It was doing all the right things. It was just like it was lying to the compiler about what it was actually trying to dereference. And you, you had to find all the places where you had to say, no, no, it's not actually sock adder. It's sock adder storage. You do actually have 255 bytes here and dealing with that. So that's sort of been ongoing work, uh, which is... It's, it's been a little painful, to say the least. Um, there's also been issues on, uh, with file systems. Uh, XFS had a lot of uh, similar one element stuff that went back and forth, but uh, sock adder was by far the worst of it because that was a very intentional, we're just gonna straight up lie to the compiler and move on and not refactor anything. We're just blah. So huge tech debt uh, there. But um, for the most part, that's, that was one of the only serious offenders. Um, and what was so terrible is there's all these places where you just happen to have a structure that ended in, a, in an array, and the compiler had to say, I don't know about this. This could be just like sock adder. I, I, can't, I can't touch it. Anyway, I think I saw another hand. So, I, yeah, um, what is the process going forward to ensure that new changes don't introduce these old styles. Um, is the like strict flex arrays option enough? Um, it's enough to <laughs> make the kernel not boot and do other terrible things. Um, this, is a, this is a place that I would like a little bit more help from the compilers on, but I've sort of been uh, picking my battles. Like, can I get the feature that gets us the code gen we want first, and then we can get warnings later? Um, so GCC has an option called dash W zero length arrays, which will warn about the finding a definition of a zero length array, um, which would be handy because, hey, don't add those. But it doesn't catch one element arrays, uh, which are usually nonsensical. Um, there are strictly speaking, legitimate uses, uses of that, but they're weird. Um, but we can't actually use that in the kernel because of all the UAPI that we can't change. Um, so we have all these definitions of zero length arrays, even if the kernel itself doesn't uh, access the array through that member name. Um, so what I really want is a dash, you know, dash W, uh, fake flex array access, or I don't, I don't know, like where it says, oh, you're about to do something with a thing that has a definition that's zero one sized, and that'll keep it out. Um, there are some kind of hand wavy tools that we can use, like check patch, um, to say, hey, it looks like you're adding an array of zero or one size. Don't do that. Um, but the strict flex arrays will uh, definitely cause chaos if you try to use it. Um, so uh, I, I want to get those warnings, but we're n we don't have a good, a good answer yet. Thanks. I'd like to ask you the which is which will be the faster and better to to check the all the all these sloppy code and to fix it versus change to safe safer language like Rust. Um, I I like to think that um, we're we're trying to peel away as many of the ambiguities of C 
um, as possible, using less and less and less of the C language that's dangerous, uh, while other people are working on getting Rust in from the other side. Um, my expectation is we end up meeting halfway, where we have the best we can do in C, and things start coming in on the Rust side. But um, the way the kernel development process works, we it does not support kind of revolutionary change. You can't just come up and go, hey, we've just replaced all the file systems with Rust. It doesn't happen. Like, we have to incrementally make changes. So I think as Rust is coming in at the periphery, um, we still have to do our best effort to try and fix, uh, see where it is, because it's going to be a long time before uh, we get everything in, into a memory-safe language. But um, uh, my thinking is it's, they're not incompatible. Like, we can use the C and the Rust, and we'll, it's good either way. Anyway, I think we're, we're also at time, so awesome. Thank you. Thanks.